refer to something or ourselves becomes very powerful. And when we look at language, it's not just whether it's English or any other language. Um, it's, it's the way we reach out to each other. It's the way we talk about um, what's happening for us. Noam Chomsky was a, um, uh, is a linguist and he referred to things as having a surface structure and having a deeper structure or meaning. And sometimes it's that, uh, it's the way we make connection with each other is at that very deep level. And the same thing goes when we're looking at living with and coping with a chronic illness, which um, uh, has a very deeper meaning than just the label of the diagnosis itself. And, and so um, Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5 is, a, is a, um, uh, a tool that is used within the, um, the medical um, um, community, which allows then um, um, individuals to speak the same language. It describes 297 different disorders. Most, it's the most widely used diagnostic system in Canada and the US. And it, it's focusing primarily on um, uh, mental health issues. However, we have similar systems that also allow a, a variety of groups to diverse groups to speak the same language, even when it comes to physical health issues and physical health conditions. And so regardless of what the the, the physical health conditions is, some of the strategies for coping with um, uh, chronic illness are the same regardless of what the original diagnosis is. Jürgen and I have had the privilege of journeying with families, with couples, with individuals, with young children um, who all have and live with chronic illness and um, have learned some very, very helpful coping strategies as well. And so part of what we're going to be hearing today is it, it comes out of that work that we have done with individuals over the last um, 29 years. And so the language that is used oftentimes allows us to understand a diagnosis differently and understanding without the need for excessive explanations. You know, sometimes with a diagnosis, there's some, uh, some positives to that and it can give a, a, a clear picture of the condition itself. It can uh, distinguishes one set of conditions from another. Um, it's kind of like a globe. A globe identifies which continent we're speaking about, sometimes even the country or perhaps even the province, the city and the town, but it does not capture all the nuances of a specific region or the specific diagnosis either. And, and so sometimes that can make it hard because feeling like you're not being un, we're not being understood. You know, sometimes there are negatives to a handle, to a, to a diagnosis. And what I think is very important for us to remember is that there are no cookie cutter people. No two people will react exactly the same way. You know, think about the warnings of potential side effects of a drug. Um, you know, the, the one day I had counted the one and there was 37 different potential warnings that could happen with a, an over-the-counter medication. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Um, there's so many different responses to the same medical uh, uh, medication or condition. Um, and, and some of those negative handles can become our cement boots that hold us back um, and where we are fearful to step out and to do anything, or we can just accept that this is what is a new normal. Uh, this little guy here, they were having some difficulty. This is actually taken from a kindergarten classroom where it was very normal for this little one to just fall asleep because of medication and wake up about 15 minutes later ready to go uh, because he passed that peak period but needed the medication in the in the in the um, in the the dosage that he had been given, and so we can let a diagnosis become our cement boots, or we can just go, okay, I'm I'm asleep, and allow it to happen, you know, um, you know, this is the face of apraxia, 
Um, this is a child who has a speech disorder, who is unable to communicate clearly. Um, usually, usually it takes five times for a child to hear a word before they are able to learn that word and be able to use it appropriately. However, for children with apraxia, it takes them 10,000 times of hearing the same word before they are able to begin the process to get all of the muscles in their throat, um, in their jaw, in their larynx, to be able to work together 10,000 times. And yet, this is not, apraxia is not what defines him at all. It does not, he does not allow it to hold him back. He has many other parts and parcels. You know, he's a son, he's a grandson, he's a nephew, he's impish for sure, a mathematician, um, uh, silly, determined. We can come up with all kinds of different uh, labels for him, but you know, uh, whether that's, uh, you know, thoughtful, funny, uh, smart, um, um, you know, great sense of humor, independent, um, determined, but um, this child in particular was a child of faith, so, so a God-loving child, uh, hardworking, um, creative, and the list goes on and on and on. But what he does not do and what he has never done is he has never allowed his diagnosis to determine what he will and what he will not do. This young man is about to enter into, he is now grown and is now a young man and is entering into one of the most um, prestigious math programs. He has never received less than 100% in any high school math course that he has ever taken and he's taken them all, was requesting to please be able to take some more math courses um, and not have to do English. <laughs> but um, but what I'm, my point is, is that we can let it define us or it, it does not have to define us. It does not have to take over or take charge of who we are or how we see ourselves either. Um, and so the list can go on and on. And so one thing I would encourage you to think about is what are some of the labels that you allow to define yourself? Are they labels of what you can't do? Are they labels of what you can do? Are they labels of dreaming, some things that you dream of doing? Do you have a bucket list full of wishes? Or are they labels that someone else has put on you? We get to decide um, what those labels are going to be. Um, are they labels of convenience? Are they labels that might hold us back? What's the impact of that label? Do we allow ones that make us less responsible or do they make you more determined? Are they concrete boots? Do they create a pity party? Do they allow us to get our own ways? Um, um, do they inspire you? Uh, your, whatever those labels are, whatever it is we, we think about ourselves in that context, how do we hang our identity on it? Um, do they help us figure things out? Is your label, um, um, a label or is it a handle? Is it a thread? Is it the whole picture of who you are? The little guy with apraxia was not the whole picture of who he is. Um, certainly isn't going to let that be a death sentence, um, but an inspiration. You, we get to decide what does it look like for you when we look at coping? Are there things that specifically help you cope better? I would encourage you to do more of them. What helps you get to where you want to be? And what's not helpful for you as well? What it looks like for me is being able to take resources and use them when and as I've needed them, but not use them 
when things have been well. Um, 20, uh, 29 years ago, I had been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness that um, I was given 24 hours to live. And I am still here. Um, in um, 1998, then it was a few years, five years after that, that um, I had been diagnosed with a second chronic illness and um, not given a good prognosis, but I'm still here. And um, much of what you are hearing has also come out of our lived experience between Jurgen and I. And, um, and how do we make things different so that we can create a sense of quality of life? For most couples and most families where there is a chronic illness, um, the, the main squeeze, or as I like to refer to Jürgen, um, because he's more than just the label of a husband, he certainly has been, we have been in business together uh, since 1996. Um, and so, you know, yes, yes, a partner, but but it's more than that because each one of us though is going to have different responses um, when it comes to how we look at chronic illness and it tends frequently to be more based around roles than gender. Um, it does not matter if this is a same sex couple relationship. The, most, the number one most important piece about um, um, the role of a partner here is that they want to tend, they tend to want to share the burden. Guys on one hand tend to want to fix it. Women on the other hand want to try and make sense of it, understand it, maybe fuss or take care of the situation. But um, the most important one here that we often don't talk about is the fear of losing a partner to this chronic illness and what that might look like. And so usually it is that motivator of fear that can either be a positive or it can be a bit of a negative as well. There can be the ups and downs of life. And when you're up, everybody's strong. When you're down, you know, the pain and the fear of real life can be, can be very profound. When we look at children, children's resilience tends to be age related. And um, uh, as, as a parent, now, when I was first diagnosed, um, um, our youngest daughter was in grade seven. So that would make her uh, 11 years old, I believe, 11, 12. And our other daughter uh, was, was just finishing grade 10 at the time, I believe it was. Um, and so there are times that you switch between roles if you are the patient. And, um, uh, and there are times that kids take on more responsibility in families as well. If, if the child is still living at home. Um, and so there's gonna be times of switching roles when uh, a parent is unwell, but switching back during other times when things are going well. Normal family dynamics and hierarchies are very important. Um, uh, kids tend to move into caretaker roles and that is okay for a time, but it is not okay for that to be a permanent piece um, uh, or a permanent uh, a role exchange. When you're on a good stretch, be the parent and take that role back. Um, um, for children, sometimes uh, the details of an illness needs to be dependent on chronological age and their knowledge. You know, oftentimes I hear, oh, but they seem so much older for their age. No, no, actually they're not. And their comprehension is age related, not based on someone else's diagnosis. And so what becomes crucially important is to match the knowledge with the knowledge of a parent's illness um, 
uh, or even their own illness with what they truly understand. Just because a child tells you that they get it, um, they may not in reality actually understand. I had a conversation with a woman that, uh, just on Thursday who um, is, is, has been diagnosed with a terminal illness and um, was saying of her 45-year-old and 43-year-old, um, 48, 48 and 45-year-old um, um, adult children who don't get and understand what's actually happening for her, but which then impacts on her ability to cope as well. And so when we look at coping, it comes in all different ways, shapes and forms. With a child, ask before sharing information, ask yourself the question, what's the purpose of sharing this information? If it's that we actually need to be able to say it, Say it to a friend or a partner, not to your child. If it's to help them cope, then give bare bones details. When we look at John Drescher's work around what are the basic needs of children, there are seven basic needs, acceptance, safety and security, significance, love, praise, um, uh, discipline, uh, uh, power or, or a God or a power greater than themselves, Drescher looked at. But what we have to be able to look at and understand is that every single child has the, these same needs. And whether we're doing well or not, it becomes important that the child's needs also get met. And if this is a time where you're not able to meet the child's needs, then it can be important to seek out someone else who is able to help the child with those particular needs. When we look at others, others who may be um, close to us, near and dear to us, sometimes people say weird things, you know? Um, and, and frequently it illustrates their lack of lived experience rather than them being heartless. It's just that they don't get it and that's okay. They care and that's what the part is that's important. Um, I remember when I was critically ill um, and had been out of the hospital on a day pass, one of the things that I absolutely wanted to do, um, uh, I've been actively involved with Girl Guides of Canada my entire life. And one of the things I really wanted to do um, um, in, in my life was go to an international Girl Guide camp. There was actually one that was being held at uh, Guelph Lake that year in 1993. And so um, um, I had three friends who said, Okay, let's go. We're taking you. So wheelchair, central lines, IV shunts. Um, none of that made a difference that day. What made a difference was the fact that they had jokingly said, you can come with us as long as you don't throw any peas around. Um, it wasn't the label. It wasn't the diagnosis. It was living it out and doing it. And living life to the fullest of whatever full meant. Uh, this was a day pass, remember, that I'm on. Because um, um, I'd already at this point been in the hospital for well over a month at that point. So one of the things that when we're talking about coping with chronic illness, that is absolutely vitally important is routine, routine, routine. And I can't stress that enough, whether that's getting eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep a night, going to bed at the same time and getting up at the same time, or within one hour um, um, of that bedtime or waking up time, that helps set our circadian rhythm and gives our body the best chance to use medication in the way in which it was researched and designed to use. Make sure that you're staying on target and on schedule. Water, we need it. 
um, a healthy diet, three meals a day, not one continuous one. Um, at the start of the pandemic, some people had said that they felt that they ought to be wearing a mask within their home as well, because um, the mask would keep them from, from picking up and eating, um, maybe perhaps some unhealthy things. But that's just on a humorous note there. Um, uh, 30 minutes of connecting with an important person to, the, to yourself. 30 minutes of doing something fun every single day. 30 minutes of a new activity. And so that new activity might be learning something new, that 30 minutes might be doing something you haven't done um, for years and years and years, but you're rekindling that. And the recommendation is 30 minutes of exercise. And so that exercise can be as simple as walking gently around, um, around a block going out. And so when people say to me, but Jan, um, um, I can't walk fast. Well, no, there's no need to walk fast. What the recommended piece is, is that we know that individuals who go out for a gentle 30 minute walk per day, um, uh, that that one activity has more impact on uh, the mental health of the individual, regardless of what their diagnosis is, um, than any psychotropic medications or antidepressant medications, that one activity, 30 minutes of walking, is more impactful and effective than um, than, than adding one more medication to the routine. Now, there are times that medications are essential, and that is something that you follow with your doctor's advice always, but I want to encourage you to go for that gentle walk. And, and you know, when we talk about a gentle walk, what I'm referring to here is the same speed that you would walk with a newborn infant in a, in a buggy. And so that's not a fast walk at all. That's more methodical, but it's just getting out and doing it. When we look at routines, um, it, one of the other routines that is absolutely essential is, and, and for some people, they have had a really hard time through COVID, maintaining a hygiene regime, uh, whether that's dental, whether that's getting up and getting dressed or, or the exercise component. Um, but all routines, including actually, there's a really cool, there's some really cool research that has come out. The individuals who have done the best at uh, homeschooling are those individuals who go out for, um, for a 30 minute walk before school in the morning or before work, come back, but then um, put shoes on their feet while they are at home and working are far more productive than individuals who don't. So that has been a really interesting piece. The research had been done 30 years ago and um, everything that has been done since the beginning of COVID has reaffirmed that. And so that's for us as well, that, okay, maybe what we need to be doing is considering putting those shoes on. So when we look at exercise, Sometimes we have to find the humor in, in things, you know? Um, I got up this morning and I ran around the block five times and then I got tired. So I picked up the block and I put it back in the toy box. And <laughs> sometimes that's all the day is going, to, is going to be able to afford for us. Now, one thing I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this next, um, section, but I, I've included it because I want for you to have the ability to come back to this um, and have the information. Many individuals with chronic illnesses oftentimes will say to me, but Jan, I can't, uh, I really can't go and exercise. Nobody's home. I don't have anybody to walk with. There is a, a tool, it's called a Minder Mobile, and it is a personal alert mobile. So 
what if he can't hit the button? You know, we know Lifeline, well, you have to be able to hit the button in order to um, access the other, the other end. But with, um, with this, you do not have to, and it's used um, on your, on, I believe it's every smartphone now. It has a GPS locator and it will, um, it's proactive and it alerts others on their phone there is a warning individual, but you are able to you are able to get help with this device. So if that's something that stops you from going out because you don't want to go out by yourself, um, there's also a panic button feature as well. But the machine will ask you if you are okay, and so that has become a, a really helpful tool for individuals living with chronic illness. So. Um, when we look at building for success, whether you're a senior, whether you're somebody at home, a CEO, a JKSK to grade 12 student homemaker working from home, everybody, we have all been impacted by living um, um, somewhat isolated lives for the last two and a half years. And so we joke, uh, Jürgen and I joke quite frequently um, because all of the photos <clears throat> of me, including the one that Darren has used today, um, has me actually with short hair. No, we've, be, we've all been part of this um, um, major historical event that has happened called COVID. And so we've all been impacted negatively by isolation, but it doesn't have to be negative. It can be a positive. We just have to do something with that right now. So, Jürgen. Jürgen, you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just going to be speaking um, for the next few slides about a partner's perspective. And much of, of this has come out of our own learning and of dealing with chronic illness. And a lot of it also has come from clients. So one of the things, no matter what stage you're at, whether you're just discovering that you have a chronic illness or you're many years into it, I think a really important thing is to keep in mind, it's a learning process. Uh, we, we learn so much about each other and we learn different things at different stages of life. And so it is, uh, it is sort of in a lifelong learning uh, when you're dealing with a chronic illness. I think one of the other things that became very important is coming to terms with limitations for both of you. Uh, what is, you know, for the partner who has the chronic illness, uh, what is it they can and cannot do or finds very difficult to do? And if it's difficult to do, how can we enhance their ability to do that if, uh, if uh, they are still wanting to do that particular activity. Again, allow the person what to do, do what they can, um, and don't impede on their ability to do what they enjoy. And I think this is a really important part because many people think that they can, they'll lose their hobby or they'll lose some activity that uh, was very, very important to them. And like a, an example for, for Jan, she already alluded to the fact that she was part of Girl Guides and she couldn't participate in everything that she did before. But one of the things we did is we, uh, in our garage, every spring and every fall, we had about 12,000 cartons of Girl Guide cookies come and we distributed them. And that way we could still participate in something that was very important to her. And again, don't assume what is best for the other person. Um, communicate daily about what is happening for you both. Where are you at? How much energy do you have today? Uh, what would you like to do today? Um, and when our children were younger and they were very much part of this process, one of the things we let them do is have a say in what was going on. Jan, could you transfer or switch to the next slide? There is a recognition that um, uh, there is an ebb and flow to daily life. And like Jan said, routine is important. Knowing when to expect things to happen. Uh, and that could even uh, uh, include daily cleanup. 
helping each other with kitchen chores, with uh, cleaning the house. Uh, those are all things that make up part of the ebb and flow of daily life. Uh, recognize when your energy reserves are low and don't be afraid to admit it. Admit it. And there are times when I've run out of steam at the end of a day and I need to say to Jan, you know what, I just can't, uh, I just can't do that other item uh, tonight or that other chore tonight, I will do it tomorrow. And the same for her. There is times when I recognize uh, that often um, the mornings are best for her when she wants to get things done. And so we often participate together so that those chores can be accomplished. Often people don't give themselves enough credit for patience. Be patient with yourself and your partner. Uh, that is an extremely important thing to do. As a partner of, of someone who suffers with chronic illness, I also recognize the need to do my own self-care, do the things that are important to me. I love taking our dog for a walk. I go fishing. I um, attend a men's group. Those are things that are still important to me and I make time for them. Because whether we want to admit it or not, our partner uh, cannot provide all the needs from a social and emotional uh, aspect. And often we need to see, um, uh, seek the, the help of others and allow them to participate. Understanding that we all need socialization, particularly after we've been in this pandemic for almost two and a half years now, uh, it feels so good to be able to talk to people again and to, to get together in uh, gatherings. And though with Jan's particular situation, we need to limit how many people come and we still do the masking, we still do the social distancing, but that is important to us to keep her safe. Um, Learn to recognize that your emotions may get the better of you. There may be days where it is just too much and just being able to say that, you know what, I've had it, I'm done. I need to go read a book, I need to do something else. And like I said, talk to your partner with it and accept the help of other people. I think this is a really, really important aspect. Um, the other thing is savor life, slow down. You don't need to get, get everything accomplished you take a look at what your priorities are and what's important to you. Um, take time to have a campfire, take time to um, spend time out in your garden or your favorite place. It could be by the side of a lake. It could be a park in your city. Enjoy those things and pay attention to what's around you. One thing that we've learned uh, over time is that allowing extra time to get things done. Uh, it takes longer for Jan now with her walker to get out to the car uh, than if, she, you know, like when before uh, she had, was diagnosed with her chronic illness. Uh, don't make, don't expect of your partner to do those things that they normally would have done. Just give yourself a little extra time to do, do those things. Find ways to make life easier for both of you. Um, we were doing a kitchen renovation where I um, did the shelving in such a way that Jan could reach all the, the cooking utensils that she needed or that we were using. So it makes life easier for her to be able to just pull that drawer out at her level right, and when she's sitting down um, and makes it easier to uh, participate in the various things. And the last thing I really have to say is love your partner for who they are, despite the illness. As Jan said earlier, the diagnosis or illness does not define you. It is just part of what you're dealing with, with in life at this point. You're on mute, Jan. Yep, thank you. <laughs> I <laughs> forgot that. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I want to talk just for a few minutes about our emotional responses. Our emotions and how we feel is real. It's okay. It's more than okay. It's essential that we recognize and acknowledge how we're feeling, feel the feelings, um, then do something about it. It's okay to feel down, but then do something about it. Um, and and um, 
don't get stuck in the muck that it would be so easy to do. And yes, there is a chain of, chain of events here. And you know, we will come up with a notion or an idea which train, changes into a thought. Um, uh, then it moves on to a belief or the meaning becomes assigned to it. And actions or lack of actions are going to have an impact on us either positively or negatively. So actions can be very positive, but inaction can also be um, a negative one because we then have an outcome that we aren't wanting. And so when we look at our emotional responses, it's really important that we do something about it. Feel the feelings and then do something about it. Move on. And so... How do we stay emotionally healthy um, during difficult times? Now, you've probably, you know, and what I'm referring to here is you've probably heard most of these through COVID. Um, but just in case you haven't, I've just included them here anyways, because I think they're good at any stage or any part of life. So call or connect with friends and family. Reconnect with somebody you haven't seen or heard of. Uh, heard from in a long time. Go ahead, use Zoom, use FaceTime. I learned how to use WhatsApp this week. Um, Jane and Doxy Me, they're all platforms that are secure platforms. And, and connect with folks. Um, you know, finish a craft that maybe you started or learn a new one. Um, why don't, what about reading? What about listening to some old tapes, records, CDs, eight track? Hey, we found an eight track tape when we were packing to move, like that's a hundred years ago. Um, but the important part here is to stay connected with the things, the people, the beliefs that are important for you. If it's a faith group or a community group or a cultural group, stay connected with them. And so when we look at how to stay emotionally healthy still, learn a new language, Duolingo. I find this absolutely fascinating. Duolingo is the one app that um, um, it is to help you learn a new language. And the number one language that has been learned through COVID um, right across all age spans is Japanese. I find that fascinating. I never thought about learning Japanese, but it's given me something to think about. Um, um, learn to play a new instrument or rekindle an instrument that maybe you played before. Yoga, you can do online. Zumba, you can do online. Tai Chi or I Chi. I Chi is done in the water. Um, but it's important that we look at how we're going to stay emotionally healthy intentionally. It doesn't happen by happenstance. It doesn't just happen on its own. We have to become specific and intentional about it. Chair yoga, um, um, chair exercises, uh, as we said earlier, walking, cycling, um, uh, choosing a sports team to, and start and follow them. What about gardening? What about flower arranging? The list goes on and on and on. But the important part is do something. Do something that gives meaning and texture to your life. A diagnosis is only one thread in the tapestry of your entire life. One thread. It's an important thread, but it's only one thread. It's not who you are. What about trying a new recipe um, each week? For the first year of COVID, we tried out a new recipe every single week. Some weeks we actually did too, but you know, it, oh, we had some, we, we, we've had some real yummy ones, but we also had one that was <clears throat> not that good. And I did not keep that recipe. So anyways, what about a book club? What about downsize part of your, part of your house? Take one drawer a day and clean it out. What about decluttering? 
What about teaching someone else something that you're good at or not? Just something you might enjoy doing. Doesn't mean you have to have a, be, be, be the expert at it. What about singing? Is singing something that would be important or humming for you? Researching family trees, organizing photos, bird watching, feeding, writing letters, um, uh, write a book, draw, sketch, take a course. But the most important thing is absolutely refuse to wallow in self-pity. Nobody actually ever gets a chance to choose what their life is going to look like. We're all in this thing called life together. Perhaps we're in different boats, but you're not alone. You don't have to be alone. Others need you as much as you need them. And the, it's important for you to get involved in the best activity, whether that's a physical activity or a crafting activity. And so what makes something the best activity for you? The one that you're going to do. But it's also equally important to remember, breathe, darling. This is just a chapter. It's not your whole story. It doesn't have to be your whole story. So I have a motto, and this is something that I have posted inside my desk that I look at every single day. And I think about every single day. And I'm going to share it with you. It may not be your model, but it's mine. And that is that today is a new day. I can use it how I wish. Let me choose to make a difference. It does matter what I choose because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. Don't let me regret the price that I have paid for how I spend this day. So I am going to open this up to everyone. What would, is there something you would like to share that has helped you be able to cope? How can Jurgen and I be a resource for you? What have you found helpful through the pandemic or coping? And what might be the one takeaway thought that you would want to um, um, take with you from this today? Yes, Jeff. Um, I'm only able to attend virtually this one seminar. Okay. You said these are going to be recorded. Can we access other seminars um, in the future? Uh, for the conference or yes for the conference yeah so most of them are are recorded um there will be a few that were not because they're like um people are sharing some personal right. stuff but yeah. in general like the plenaries for sure most of most of them that will be recorded um and posted probably in two or three weeks depending okay. on yeah so the opening how much cleanup they have and all that. Anyone, they'll have that yeah okay that's great yeah it's been very helpful. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Is there something specific that you could see yourself taking this with you today and implementing it? Yeah. Yeah. What would it be for you, Ian? Making a difference every day. Making a difference, okay. Whether it's like a difference to my neighbor, to me, to my new grandson, whatever, to, you know, yeah, maybe the community, who knows? Yeah. Yep. And you've got today to do that. Yeah. 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 When yeah. I had been given 24 hours to live, um, um, I realized the value of every single day, of every single breath and use it, you've got it, use it. Mm -hmm. well, I, 
I think for me, I think it um, all the sort of advice and, and sort of the, the concepts like aren't limited to just if you have a chronic illness. I think this is like right. if you're caring, if it's just everything going on. So it's just, it's adapting to what you can do to be healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah, because so I wasn't prepared to, to live by a label. And so yeah. it had to be generic because I'm just a little bit stubborn. Just a little. And everyone's more than the one label. Right so. on. Yes. Yeah. Everyone, everyone experiences things slightly different and unique and has unique strengths. So mm -hmm. sounds like a great partnership, a great marriage. Well, we've had to work at it. <laughs> I can't remember. I think it's 44 years, is it? Uh, yes. Is it 45? Year. 44 Whoa. this year. When, when I call anybody during COVID, and I'm only speaking to one person, I said, I want to speak to the other, at least hear the other person, because you might be standing there in a pool of blood with a smoking gun. So put the other person on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there anything anyone is wondering that we haven't covered? Um, yeah, so there is uh, someone uh, wanting to ask an anonymous question, sort of, um, could you speak to sort of the challenge of feeling, uh, of not wanting to feel weak or feeling weak in your partner's eyes? So by um, and coping. For which person? The person with the chronic illness or for the partner who maybe can't do absolutely everything? I would guess probably both, like both sides of it. That kind of got echoed by a few people. Okay, all Maybe right. So. Um, I I had to give up my superwoman cape um, that I used to wear and admit that I have limitations. My friends, some of whom are on here, um today know that and know that that was not an easy piece for me to be able to say okay i've had enough i'm done because that was never my style but knowing that i'm not about or our relationship is not about um who's going to accomplish what first best this isn't about one-upmanship this is about a partnership that we're in this boat together um the two of us we did not count on this being what life would look like for us but ta-da we're here and we're about to do it together Jürgen is there something you would like to add yeah, I, I, th I think, uh, and you touched on it in the slides, Jan, is about guys wanting to fix it. And <laughs> if you can't fix everything, you, you it doesn't mean you're weak. Mm -hmm. It just means that, you know what, you have limitations on physical limitations and emotional limitations um, on what you do. And mm -hmm. it took a long time for me to kind of uh, adapt and adjust to that. But I'm, you learn to be comfortable with what you can and cannot do. And I think that's an important aspect is not, not to be down on yourself just because you can't play superhero and fix it all. Do what you can. And I think the other thing I, I've learned to do is to rely on friends and ask for help, which often is very hard for guys to do. But uh, learning that was uh, a, a sense of freedom for me in being able to just, you know what, it's okay if I call my guy friend over and we work on, you know, some project around the house. It's okay. It's it it's not doesn't mean that um, I'm weak in any sense, but um, uh, I'm accepting that help and also forming a, re a better relationship with that person. 
I think the other piece I'd like to add is that we also have come up with a phrase between the two of us, and that's a mountain for another day to climb. Mm -hmm. um, when we were planning on moving from Southern Ontario to um, Brookside, Nova Scotia, um, and moving, <laughs> I don't know that you've seen all these books behind us, but this is only about a quarter, not even a quarter, um, um, yeah, almost a tenth of the books because it's all up this other wall too and downstairs in the other one. Um, but we, we learned that we, you can only climb so many mountains in a day. And that's a mountain for another day. And that's just the way it is. Whether that's going somewhere, seeing someone, doing something, planning something, if, if, if it's important enough to get done, perhaps it'll be tomorrow. But if it's not, it's about loving the other person and being in that relationship, not for what they can offer, but for who they are right now. Was there another one, Darren, in the chat? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay. Now we're just asking about resources and just to let people know that we do have resources on the PHA Canada website, um, you know, for both patients and caregivers. We're starting to develop a little bit more for caregivers. We have monthly meetups where it's no agenda, like we're not even in the room. We just host the Zoom, put everyone in rooms, and it's just really just to meet people. Because mm -hmm. um, I think that's a lot of the support that, that you can kind of find out, you know, kind of just other people. You're not alone in sort of some of the feelings. You're not alone in some of the things. And often you can learn tips from other people, sort of how they cope with things and stuff. Um, or even just what questions. And then you can always just email any one of us at the, at the PHA Canada and we'll do our best to kind of connect in and get you to other places. But, um, and then of course, you know, we hook up with like fabulous presenters who come up with great pieces of wisdom. Um, so yeah, um, I'm conscious of the time. We've now reached 4.32. Um, so we're gonna have to close it up soon, okay. if not, soon oh yeah i'm keeping um but i want to thank both jen and jurgen um enjoy your haligonian life and, uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're trying <laughs> well, thank you for it's a good time summer's a great us. time it's like one giant patio um <laughs> there and uh, i want to thank everyone for joining us as i said we did record it um it might take us a while to just pretty it up and kind of get everything settled because a few of us are going on vacation after but um yeah. Oh, Ian. Did you have something, Ian? Hold on. No, no, I was just incompetent trying to fiddle around the reactions. Oh. I just want to say what a great presentation. And you two, you, as far as I'm concerned, the both of you got reserved seating in heaven. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So come what may, you're sailing through this thing, you know? But if there is anything or any way we can be a resource for any of you, we are a click away, okay? And, or a phone call away. Um, yeah. uh, we do want. have a, a, uh, a website. It's under actassociates.ca. Both Jürgen and I are, are uh, psychotherapists and marriage and family therapists. So, and by the way, those were degrees that were learned after uh, coming out of the coma and relearning how to um, do everything from, uh, eating to walking to reading and learning English again. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and you can always just email me and I'll kind of forward your information to as well. Yeah. So, all right. the best to everyone. Yes. All the best to everybody. Yes, absolutely. And thank Take you care. all. And hopefully, uh, attend the rest of the conference and um, have a great week. Enjoy. Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.